Hi, this is the first of a series of lectures about Fong lighting and various related topics. Uh, so you can see this in chapter four in the book from the beginning parts so is what I'm talking about right now. This presentation will just be an overview and uh, I'll give a brief synopsis of what the purpose is of Fong lighting, what its ingredients are. We'll see a couple examples and then the later videos will get more into the details. So first of all, Fong lighting is crucial for or other local lighting models of its of its ilk are crucial for creating semi-realistic looking three-dimensional scenes. So far we've been dealing mostly with wireframe images and with wireframe you can see the the shape of the surfaces especially with some motion you get a nice sort of impression of a 3D object moving around but only in wireframe mode. If you make them solid colored uh, like we saw with the initial project, they turn very flat and featureless. The objects no longer look three-dimensional unless you put motion back into it. So Fong lighting will let us use a subtle shading of colors to recreate a three-dimensional appearance of objects. And so this is a kind of local lighting model. So what local means is that we don't take into account global light effects. We look always at one point on a surface and one light source, and we look how does that light source light, light up that point on the surface. We don't worry about, or we can't worry about things like shadows or multiple reflections and so forth, or mirror images, etc. So what we do is we consider here, we consider a single light source at a time. We could do multiple light sources, but we we only look at one at a time, and how it illuminates or lights up a point on a surface. The surface itself is going to be modeled usually with triangles, so it's, the surface is a bunch of flat pieces that are supposed to go together and look smooth. So we're going to use this long lighting plus smooth shading to um, hide the appearance of the triangles so, you, so the surface looks smooth in the final image in spite of the fact that it's modeled with triangles. So the kind of inputs we have to a Fong lighting calculation include the following, and I'm not going to list everything because there's just too many to list. We're going to have some point or on a surface On the surface, and I'll call it X. It's the position of the point. So here's our surface S. Here's a point X sitting on it. This is the bottom of the surface here, the inside of the surface. There's some light source here, and it's illuminating that point on the surface. There's a normal vector, a perpendicular vector N, which is a unit vector, a unit normal vector. So what I mean by that is that uh, its unit means it has length 1. Normal vector means it's normal to the surface, so it's perpendicular to the surface. So that defines the orientation of the surface. And then we have the color of the surface, which really means the reflectivity of the surface. This is usually RGB values for reflectivity. And so what these color, these are so-called material properties, by the way, because we think of the surface being made of some material, and these are properties of the material. So if your surface has green paint on it, it will reflect green light very well and absorb red light and blue light, for instance. So these material properties are red, red green, blue values that tell you how well the surface reflects light. There will be a shininess or that tells you how glossy the surface is. Uh, sometimes people use a metalness property uh, or a roughness property. Uh, this is not really part of the Fong lighting model, but it is part of other local lighting models. So this is the first set of inputs, is the position of a point on the surface, the normal vector, and its reflectivity values and shininess. The second set of inputs is properties of light. I'll put that on the next board. So 
inputs continued is going to be the position of a light or perhaps the direction the light is coming from. To when it hits X. So direction when it's arriving at the point X. And the, the color of the light, or the, the brightness, which is how much light is being emitted. And this is usually given with RGB values. So those are the main inputs, but now things get a little bit unexpected. Fong lighting is a quasi-physical model in the sense of we're somewhat, but all that, not all that accurately, modeling the physics of how light reflects off of surfaces. And by modeling the physics, that means that our geometric models, our computer models, will look somewhat like things in the real world. It lets us tweak appearances in a way that can look somewhat real. Um, but it's only quasi-physical, it's not fully physical, and so we, we take some shortcuts, and one of the shortcuts is we actually split light up into different types. So we've got three different kinds of light, and they're all handled by different computations. Um, and these are, of course, nothing physical about having three different kinds of light. All light is just photons, but we're sort of thinking of different types of effect the light has. So the first kind that I want to mention is diffuse light. So diffuse light means light that comes from a particular light source, comes from a single light position, or single direction, and is reflected off the surface in all directions. Usually equally in all directions. So this is sort of what you normally think of when a surface is being lit. You've got something shining on it, and it just gets some color based on the light hitting it. But we also have something related to that, is ambient light, which is light that comes from all directions. So it doesn't come from a particular source, but it just sort of comes generally from all over the place. and reflects in all directions. And so the first one is pretty understandable. You've got a light source, you can't see them in the camera, but I've got light sources in the ceiling, like a big bright light up above me to light up the screen. But there's also light sort of bouncing around the room. It's coming off the lights that are shining, it hits the walls, the walls reflect some light, that reflects off, goes other places. So places like um, underneath the tray here on the blackboard, even though there's no light really shining that directly on it, well, at, least, at least this part here, there's no light shining directly right there, but if you bent down and looked there, you'd still, it wouldn't be completely black. And that's because there's light shining off of the floor back up there to illuminate it. So this is ambient lighting, models the effect of light that hasn't come directly from a light source, but it sort of bounced around the scene and then ends up everywhere, right? And then the third one is specular light. And this is light that comes from a particular light source. Comes from a single light source and then reflects mostly in a mirror-like direction. But not it's not really mirrors, but it reflects mostly in a mirror-like direction. But it's not a perfect, it's not making a mirror image of anything, it's just reflecting mostly in that direction. So the light sp spreads out as it reflects. And um, let me show you some examples of this. I brought a piece of fruit, it's a persimmon, and a Halloween thing. Halloween was about four days ago, which is a ceramic pumpkin. Right, so if, if I hold these up, you can't see the lights in my room the way the camera's set up, but you can see that there's all these shiny spots on the top of the persimmon and on the top of the pumpkin. Actually, there's some down here because I've got some lights on the floor. Um, and so uh, those are specular highlights. So these shiny spots are specular highlights. Should 
I'll write that down. I'll try to do this without getting marker on my persimmon. Shininess, uh, shiny spots. are called specular highlights. So this is where the specularly reflected light is reflected in a pretty much mirror-like direction and made shiny spots. And you'll see shiny spots on all sorts of objects, not just, not just persimmons and ceramic pumpkins, but all sorts of things have specular highlights. So those are the, the white shiny spots on the objects. The other thing to notice is if you look at the, let's do this, the persimmon. If you look at the persimmon, it's brighter red on the top or brighter orange on the top than the bottom. Well, why is it brighter on the top? Because there's a bright light up there on the ceiling shining on it. There are some lights shining on the bottom, but they're not as bright. And so this is an example of diffuse lighting. The diffuse lighting coming from above hits the top and makes it brighter. There's less light coming from the bottom so it's not as brightly lit diffusely, so it's darker. Um, on the other hand, for ambient lighting, this is a hollow pumpkin there. If I, if I look inside it, unfortunately it's hard for me to show you, well, maybe I can show you. If I turn it around, if you look in there, there's no light source, there's no light in the room that's shining directly on that point there, but it's not completely black, right? It's a, it's a brownish color, so from the paint on the inside of the pumpkin. So what's happened there is even though no light is shining directly on there, it's not completely black. There's light that's bouncing around the room that's getting in there anyway and uh, giving it some color. So that's an example of ambient lighting. Uh, there's one more kind of lighting I haven't mentioned, which is emissive light, which doesn't come from a light source at all. It just is emitted like a glowing object. So emissive light, this is just a, a glowing surface. Think of the, if you have a, um, a, a stove top with a metal coil heating things up, it glows red when you put it on hot. Well, that's just glowing from its own glow. It's a, it's, uh, it doesn't cause, in the Fong lighting model, that doesn't light anything else. It doesn't act as a light source in its own right, but it just attaches a color to a surface that's added on, even though no light is causing it. So these are the main ingredients of the Fong lighting. I'm going to switch over to the computer for a minute and show some fong lighting effects on the teapot and then we'll that'll be the end after that of the presentation thank you see you in a moment at the computer so this image is taken from the textbook uh, it's actually shown from the original postscript files which give better results than the more modern pdf files uh, so there's uh, more solid-looking teapots here than you can see if you download the PDF yourself. Uh, what's shown here is the Utah teapot rendered first without any lighting effects at the top row, then on the second row in teapots C and D with diffuse and ambient lighting only, and on the third row, teapots E and F with diffuse, ambient, and specular lighting. The ones on the left-hand side are wireframe or rendered with flat shading, C and, and E are rendered with flat shading. The ones on the right hand side are either no lighting like B or rendered with smooth shading like D and F. So in fact the same lighting calculations are used for both sides. On the left hand side the flat shading, the lighting is done at each vertex and each vertex then gives the color to an entire rectangle forming the surface of the teapot and you can see very clearly the rectangular shape of the surface, um, the rectangular patches on the surface. On the right-hand side, the, it's just smooth shaded, so each rectangle is just an average of the colors from the adjacent vertices, and the rectangles disappear. It looks like a smooth sort of surface. The, looking at the ones on the right-hand side, teapot number B at the top, is just one solid color. You see no notion of three-dimensionality at all. It looks like a cutout teapot. It's just a silhouette of a teapot. It doesn't really look like a three-dimensional object. Adding ambient and diffuse lighting gives us teapot D, the second one in the right-hand column, and this has 
ambient lighting, which is sort of general light coming from all sources, and diffuse lighting coming from a particular light source. The bright areas of the teapot are somewhat bright red. Those are the parts of the teapot facing the light source, and they're, they're lit more brightly just because they're facing the light source. As the teapot curves away from the light source, it gets darker and darker until the only light source on the teapot is ambient. There's a very low level of ambient light, enough to keep it from being completely black, but not enough to keep it from looking very dark red. The third teapot on the right-hand side adds specular lighting. This is this bright white patch here. This is a bright reflection around the direction of near perfect mirror reflection to, towards the light source, and it adds an extra visual cue that makes us see the three-dimensionality. So as you can see from these images, the long lighting is crucial for changing the teapot from a flat silhouette looking thing into a three-dimensional looking object. The shading is also crucial to, to allow us to model smooth objects with rectangles in this case, or triangles in the more general case, uh, render smooth objects so that they are, although they're modeled with triangles or rectangles, that those disappear from view and they look smooth to the viewer. So we'll be learning more about how to do all these things in the next few pre-recorded videos. That's the end of this one. Thank you very much.